This is our extended video on the median to radial nerve transfer. This patient had three months uh, previously a humeral fracture. It was explored and it was noted that the radial nerve was completely transected. So no chance of recovery and we're going in for this patient with the median to radial nerve transfer and at the same time a tendon transfer from the pronator teres to the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Left arm, and you can see it's a long incision. And you'll note that I'm under tourniquet. And my plan is, as noted in that table of contents that Andrew just uh, showed you, and you can go back in 40 minutes. You, if you're interested in one part of it, then you can zoom into and focus on one part of this longer operation. The short video we have for this is 17 minutes, so you know longer than what we normally would have in our short and extended uh, videos. So we're under tourniquet, and I am thinking I need to stimulate my donors, my median working donors. I need to identify and protect the anterior interosseous nerve. I need to find my FCR, flexor carpi radialis, and FDS as I'm uh, coming through this procedure. And you'll see a little later on that when I'm starting to elevate my tendon, I'm already 20 some minutes into the procedure. And then you'll see I'm picking up the pace a little bit. So we like to give these longer um, videos so that you can see um, you know, where we're struggling, where we're slowing down, what the issues are, and 40-some um, minutes is, you know, demanding a fair bit of your time. But this is a, a nerve transfer that can give you really great results. And I started doing this, wow, more than a decade ago. Uh, my results now are cleanly better than they were when I started out. But their anatomy is, um, uh, it's not that challenging, but there's no room for error. So you've got to know the branches of the recipient and the donor. And we uh, actually would grade this as a four-star uh, challenging nerve transfer. What you'll get with this nerve transfer, though, is a option, a potential for independent, beautiful, fluid, um, finger and thumb uh, extension. And you can't get that when you're taking a single tendon, for example, flexor carpi radialis to the tendon for uh, finger extension. I try to encourage patients, if they have reasonable passive range of movement, to have the tendon transfer done at the same time as the uh, nerve transfer for wrist extension. So ECR, B, uh, tendon transfer from pronator teres. So the cephalic vein is above. The nerve um, adjacent to that will be the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, and you'll see that in a bit. And I'll sometimes take the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve end-to-end -to, -end to the radial sensory nerve to get some sensation back on the dorsum of the hand. In this case, I am going to take the radial sensory nerve and put it end to side to the median nerve. Maybe not quite as robust a uh, sensation as with an end to end, but I take advantage of leaving all of the LABC innervation intact. Now the first step in this procedure is I have to find the tendon of the pronator teres. And to do that, I look for two structures, the radial artery, which you can see coming up here, and then just lateral to that or radial to that, the radial sensory nerve. And you can see the radial sensory nerve coming into view here. And between those two structures, that's where you're going to find the pronator teres tendon. And if you don't follow those uh, two rules, it can be a struggle trying to find out where that pronator teres is. And when you're trying to do this dissection fairly promptly, so you can do your stimulation of the donor, uh, time is really valuable. The second point here is that I'm now going to extend, this is where the timing comes in. If we're not doing the tendon transfer, I just step lengthen the 
tendon of the superficial head of the pronator teres. That doesn't take any time at all. But if I'm going to move the pronator teres tendon up and over to the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon, then I need to extend the tendon of the superficial head of the pronator teres along the periosteum of the radius and elevate that um, periosteal extension. And that takes time. I want to be able to stimulate within 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes at the latest, um, and I really got to hoof it in order to be able to elevate that extension of the pronator teres and then reflect the pronator teres back. You're not going to be easily find the median nerve proximally unless you do release this tension on that pronator teres. So I'm extending my uh, incision here so I can get a longer run on that extension of the periosteum from the tendon of the pronator teres. You may think she's going too far distal. She doesn't need to go that far. Just, you know, end your extension on that periosteal extension of the pronator teres tendon. But later when you see me putting that uh, pronator teres tendon over to ECRB, just sort of observe and see if you really think I have too much periosteal extension. I don't think I do. And there is going to be variability in the where you're going to find the tendon meeting the muscle of ECRB. So you don't want to be in a situation where you can't get a nice weave of the pronator teres tendon into the ECRB. Hence, I like to go long and have a nice long extension of the um, uh, pronator teres tendon. Be careful of the radial sensory nerve. It's not working. So, so what if you cut it? Well, I'm going to try to get some sensation in it. So I don't want to have a downstream injury on LABC or radial sensory because I'm going to maintain the sensation in the LABC territory and I'm going to put some sensation in with the end aside radial sensory to median sensory. So sharp dissection following that tendon of the PT, pronator teres, down onto the radius. Uh, at this point, you better make sure you have your elevator ready. So you are under the tourniquet. You don't want to be waiting while they go out and try to find whatever periosteal elevator you like to use to um, elevate this periosteum. So I like a number nine Joseph, and I try to remember to make sure that they have it uh, before I even start the case. And I like the long extension, just like I, um, I talked about. So sharp dissection, cutting right down onto the bone. Leave it wide enough. Uh, it, it looks wide and it looks long, and then it's never wide enough or long enough. So you can't really over, overdo that. And now I'm about 20 minutes into my tourniquet. So you'll see uh, me... Um, picking up the pace just a little bit, and also um, also having available, in case I need it, the more expensive but more robust checkpoint nerve stimulator, uh, not just the very stim, which is inexpensive, but only goes to two amps. I can get the checkpoint and give it more juice if I need to because of that critical uh, requirement of stimulating your donors and making sure you've got the right donor. And that's also going to help with your tourniquet issue. My associate, Ida Fox, does this operation without tourniquet because she doesn't want to be hassled with, uh, you know, more quickly doing the procedure. So it's sort of, it's your choice. So my number nine, Joseph, elevating, um, trying not to get holes in the uh, periosteal extension as I'm elevating this. And as soon as I have released the attachment of the pronator teres tendon on the bone. Then I'm going to go quickly up now, find my median nerve proximally. So I don't have to elevate it particularly. Uh, I do need to just detach its attachment to that radius so that the pronator teres will be loose and I can come proximally and find the median nerve. Now in this patient, um, she didn't he didn't have a very robust deep head of pronator teres, but sometimes that is really tight proximally and you have a bit of trouble finding the median nerve. I didn't in this case. It was more uh, easily visualized than, than normally. Usually it's hidden 
right against the muscle and it's hard to find. Also note when I'm finding the nerve to the pronator teres, you're not going to get pronation of the uh, hand or forearm because you've detached that attachment. So when you're saying, oh, is this the nerve to the pronator and you stimulate it, you're not going to get a lot of forearm pronation because you've just detached the pronator attachment. As soon as you um, identify the Lacertus fibrosis, you can divide it. There's no particular timing on that step of the release. So you can see the Lacertus just coming right there into, into view. Detach that Lacertus. And now I need my median nerve. And I stay on the muscle and I stay medial to the vessels. So don't start dissecting in the vessels. Just push them over uh, radially or laterally and hug the flexor pronator muscle and that's where you're going to find your median nerve. You've got to stay true to that um, step or you'll waste time. So you'll see all the vessels and you see the muscle and you won't see the median nerve and you'll, it's frustrating but just stick to being medial to the vessels Stay on the muscle and your median nerve will show itself. And there's the median nerve coming into view. Not much of a deep pronator on this patient. Now the first nerve you're going to see is the nerve to the pronator. And you can stimulate that nerve and you'll see the muscle contract, but you're not going to see the robust pronation because you have detached the pronator. The deep head of the pronator will be to the upper right hand part of the screen um, adjacent, right in there where the pickups are just touching. So that's where you'll find the deep head. Now at this point, you don't see any of your donor branches. There's your nerve to the pronator just above my scissors. And there's a little branch there. Let's try to protect that. Separate the pronator nerve from the little vessel, divide the vessel. I use hemoclips because it's faster and I am wanting, as I've said a few times, I need to remember I've got to stimulate. Now, if, you, if you're too late and you're not getting a stim, then you've got to let the tourniquet down, uh, give it a rest of, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, and then you should be able to stimulate. But there was a paper by Larry Hurst from London, Ontario, which said that after 15 minutes, 50, sorry, five zero minutes of ischemia, you may not be able to stimulate even for 24 hours. That's rare, but uh, it's a it's a problem if you're not really familiar with this procedure. There's a little tendon band there. I don't know if that's the deep head of the pronator or superficialis. One or the other, it's going to go later. And you can see it coming off in a sort of a V from that superficial pronator teres. So loosen that whole pronator up because we're going to be moving it over to ECRB tendon in a fish weave fashion at the end of the procedure. So I'll do my nerve repairs, get my tendon ready before I do the nerve repairs, but do the tendon transfer as the last maneuver. Now you have to do this. You've got to identify the median nerve into the forearm or you're not going to find your branches. And you'll be doing some ridiculous internal dissection of the median nerve, and you're not even going to find them then. So um, there's a pronator branch there. And once you reflect the and divide the attachment of the deep head of the pronator and elevate your superficial pronator and divide any tenderness leading edges of the flexor digitorum sublimus, then your donor median branches are just going to display themselves. So there's the superficialis, superficialis arch, tendinous arch, we'll be releasing that for sure. These branches of the median nerve are pre-dissected. You don't have to dissect them. There's no intraneural necessary dissection. And here's how, they, here's how it works. The first one that you're going to see deep in ulnar is FCR. If there is a Palmaris longus, it'll be with it. So just under my finger there, that's the, there's the FCR. If there is a Palmaris longus, you can neuralize that fascicle separate from FCR and leave the Palmaris longus. These crossing vessels I am going to take. And again, I'll use hemoclips. You can use ties, but 
the hemoclips for me are faster. When I'm putting the hemoclips on, I make sure that there's a good distance between the two clips so that I'm not going to have a clip fall off because I don't have enough tissue distal to that clip. And then you'll get oozing and bleeding, which is time consuming and annoying. And then you're buzzing near your nerves. Now the, the branch that comes off just right there, just radial, is the anterior interosseous nerve. So that is definitely not a donor. Your donors are all coming off ulnar. If you look at some of the original drawings that Andrew and I did like a decade ago, we've got the branches scrambled. We didn't, we would get the right branch because we would stimulate, but we just didn't really totally own this anatomy. I can do this transfer without nerve stimulation because I know what the branches are. But certainly in the first 10 or so I did, I would, wasn't uh, comfortable doing that without donor stimulation. So now you can see I'm bringing a checkpoint in, the more expensive, because I don't know, 40 minutes on tourniquet now. There's the anterior interosseous branch. We'll leave that alone. Come up proximal, deep, ulnar. That's your FCR. And you can put your finger on the FCR tendon and feel it uh, jumping. There's your wrist flexing. That's FCR, no finger movement there. Now come distal, and there's one FDS branch. And note that's mostly um, uh, long and ring. And then if you go more distal against the median nerve, it's just a slightly different uh, response to that stimulus. So FCR, proximal, the, the pronator teres branch is above. That's FDS right there. AIN, radial or lateral. And then the distal FDS branch. And then there's a little bit of... Um, median intrinsic on the radial side to the thenars on that median nerve. Now that distal FDS branch, I'm not taking it in my transfer. The proximal FDS I am taking. Okay, good. Now I can relax a little bit because I have my donor set up. And now you'll see that my pace of surgery is a little bit slower. Now I am going to my recipient. My recipient is radial sensory, end to side to median, extensor carpi radialis brevis, end to end to the FDS, and posterior interosseous nerve, end to end to FCR. I take a pen and I write that little recipe on the OR sheets beside me because I want the synergy of the FCR to PIN and FDS to ECRB. All right, now I've got the radial sensory nerve and I'm looking for the nerve to the ECRB. It's smaller than the radial sensory nerve and it's parallel to the radial sensory nerve. There are a lot of vessels in here and you'll see uh, sort of a little bit painful as we take down each of these little vessels as we're coming up. Following the radial sensory, donor distal recipient proximal. So recipient proximal, I have to go way proximal on my recipient. You're limited as far, how far distal you can go on your donor. You are not limited on how far proximal you can go on your recipient because these nerve transfers are for proximal nerve injury. So you can go all the way up to the nerve injury if you wanted to. Of course, we're not going to because it's in the upper arm. But I find that if you go right up to the antecubital fossa and you can see a little zig, Brunner zig across that elbow area, and then use down curves to really pull up and pull down on the nerve, up on the soft tissue. That will give you exactly the amount of recipient nerve you need if you go as far distal as you can on the donor nerve. And the overlap between the proximal end of the recipient and the distal end of the donor is six or seven centimeters on this transfer. And it's because it has to go across the forearm and maybe under or over the vessels. And see that distance between the two clips? Make it, make it too, too close together, and then you're slowing yourself down as well because it'll fall off, it'll bleed, and then you'll have to deal with that. Now I'm releasing this fascia over the brachioradialis muscle so that I can get better proximal retraction so I can get my recipient proximal story. And I am many times during all of these nerve transfers, I'm saying donor distal recipient proximal. Imagine if you did the opposite. That is not good. That would mean you'd need a nerve graft. Nerve transfers are to replace nerve grafts. There's ECRB coming up. 
It's a little smaller than the, well, it's quite a bit smaller than the radial sensory nerve, but it's parallel to the radial sensory nerve. By doing the uh, wove, woven um, pulver tap, fish weave into the tendon of ECRB and also innervating it, I'm hoping to get stronger wrist extension with the uh, addition of that nerve transfer. So I don't do an end-to-end -end tendon transfer from pronator teres to ECRB. I do a fish weave pulver tap repair. So you have to take the vessels down in order to find your posterior interosseous nerve and also in order to follow your posterior interosseous nerve proximal enough to get a decent and tension-free nerve transfer. And the PIN, unlike the radial sensory and the ECRB nerve, which are parallel to each other, goes off obliquely heading over towards the ulnar side of the forearm. I want to decompress the posterior interosseous nerve completely because when my nerves are regenerating from the median nerve into the PIN, I don't want them being slowed down at a tight spot by the tendon of the ECRB or the tendinous leading edge of the superficial head of the supinator, aka arcade of Froch. The other thing that I'll be looking for in here is that little nerve to the supinator muscle itself, which um, I won't be re because I have the biceps doing the supination and I don't want to waste precious median nerve motor fibers in that little supinator. Also makes my match between the FCR and the PIN a uh, more satisfying equal size match. Now you're retracting the tissue to identify the leading edge of the ECRB. There's the ECRB nerve, smaller than the radial sensory, but, par but parallel to it. ECRB, there it is, two branches. And then more dorsal, the uh, PIN. I'm gonna put a vessel loop around the radial sensory, a vessel loop around the ECRB, and a vessel loop around the PIN. This is a supposedly a transection of the radial nerve proximally, just in case there's any radial sensory nerve ever uh, regenerating down the radial sensory nerve, I am going to treat it proximally as I would for a potential neuroma. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Here's the PIN. It's much larger than the other two nerves, sort of small, medium, and large, ECRB, radial sensory, and PIN. But there's a lot of fatty tissue around it as well. And there's also the component of the nerve to the supinator in here that I'm going to neuralize separate. This gives me a good size match between my donor FCR and recipient PIN. It looks rather large here, but you'll see as I go proximal, just like any nerve transfer, as you go proximal, the nerve gets narrower. As you go distal, the nerve gets broader. The number of nerve fibers is the same. It's just the cross-sectional uh, diameter changes, just like the trunk of the tree, and you take advantage of that with the nerve transfers. So I'm picking up the tendinous edge of ECRB, I'll scooch away the muscle so you'll see a fair bit of tendon there. When you scooch that muscle away, you can see the tendon of ECRB. This is the release that I do for PIN nerve compression, especially if there's a component of lateral epicondylitis rather than cutting over by the lateral epicondyle and injuring those teeny, teeny little posterior radial branches. So your patient now has new pain of nerve pain. I'll take this ECRB tendon and I'll divide it straight across the forearm so that I'm loosening up that um, attachment of the tendon of the ECRB well distal to the lateral epicondyle. Look how tight the tendinous leading edge of the supinator is. And you can see this sort of ball of fat there, which has been pushed up by that tendinous edge. So that's a tight spot. And it's tight just because it is tight, and then the edema from associated with the injury is going to make that a potentially significant entrapment point. Nerves that are regenerating, radial nerves that are regenerating, we'll often find that if we decompress just like I'm doing here, you'll speed up the regeneration time-wise and quality. Down curve retractors. You can see those down curve retractors are narrower than the Army Navy's, and really, I love those instruments. So now I'm cutting the tendon and muscle of the supinator, and you can see that the muscle's pretty denervated looking. He's only three months out, but no motor units. 
and the history of the complete transection, there's the nerve to the supinator. So PIN and then just below it, the nerve to the supinator. I'm going to neuralize that away. And there's our setup, PIN, ECRB, radial sensory. Now I've got to do some work to get proximal on the recipient. Donor distal, recipient proximal. So now this part of the operation is all about recipient proximal. And I'm working on this. You can see my head will get in the way because I'm looking up, um, getting more retraction from my assistant to toe in, haul up there. And then when I do my cut on the um, recipient, I'll be pulling distally on the nerve I'm going to divide and I'll be pushing my scissors up proximally to divide it proximally. And I make sure that I can see what I'm doing so I'm not cutting some vessel as I'm trans, uh, uh, cutting across the recipient nerves. That would really slow you down because you'd have to go up there and open it up probably more proximally to get hemostasis. So pulling distal, please pull distal on that vessel loop. Please toe in proximal on the retractors. And then my job is to push those scissors up, seeing the tips of my scissors. So I am really working hard for recipient proximal. And then I'll bring my three recipients over towards the median nerve. There's the supinator, and I'll, I'm going to get rid of that now. I'll neuralize it, picking up the supinator, and then separate it from the posterior interosseous nerve. And you can see um, in the pickups uh, to the upper left, that's the PIN, and it's pretty narrow now. I have a good, I'll have a good size match between my FCR and PIN, especially as I follow my FCR distal where it starts to get a little branchy, then I, I use take advantage of that to get the perfect size match. That's a key part with all nerve transfers. Go distal on that donor for size match and tension. Radial sensory divided. Now this is the maneuver. You can see the hemostat on the proximal radial sensory, second degree injury there to crush it, moves the axonal front proximal, cauterize the distal end, uh, and then turn it around, shove it up proximally underneath the BR so that if there's ever any nerves coming down that radial sensory, it's not going to cause a painful neuroma. All right, the second part of the operation, donor distal. And you can do it either way you want. You can do donor distal recipient proximal. I guess the first time you do it, you should probably do the donor first, bring it over to your recipient because if you don't do what I'm doing now, you're going to have tension. And what I'm doing now is I am really working hard to go distal on my donor. I think this is um, an area where people don't do this and this operation is not going to work for them because they're going to have tension. Tension on a nerve repair, tension on a graft, tension on a nerve transfer. That's the downfall of all sorts of, radi or of um, nerve reconstruction. So I'm opening up that little cute fibrous tunnel in the superficialis towards the FCR, dividing all of that. So I'm following my donor FCR right almost till it hits motor end plates. There's a, often a teeny little, you know, vas, vessel that goes with the FCR. And I'll use a, see, I'm using a little hemoclip here uh, to cross the nerve, be, and then I'll cut proximal to the hemoclip. And that's so that I don't have to chase oozy little bleeders deep in the muscle at the extremes of my visual dissection. So I'm following it way distal, put a hemoclip on and then divide proximal to that. When I bring my FCR over towards my PIN, you'll see how uh, broad the size of that FCR donor is now that I followed it out into the distal branches. It's like the tree in the park. The trunk's narrow and the branches are wide. And you can take advantage of that beautiful anatomy to get your perfect size match. Now I'm following the FDS. So this is the proximal FDS. There's two FDS branches. This is a proximal one. But again, as it goes distal, it starts to branch. And you'll see in this dissection, I'm thinking, well, maybe I just need the one branch of that proximal FDS. Uh, that looks pretty good. And there's the second more distal branch. But I end up taking the entire proximal FDS branch to put into my um, ECRB because as I get the 
you know, terminal slush off of that. It's too small. I don't have a good size match. FCR over to PIN. And now I am following my FDS to get a nice size match on my FDS. There's the two branches. I'll try with the one. Well, those two branches are actually the division from the first branch. And look at the size difference there. Isn't that interesting? So if you follow back up on that FDS branch and neuralize it off the median nerve, it becomes very small. And then it branches out like crazy. So the idea of issues with size match on nerve transfers is just not going distal enough or proximal enough. Because you can get whatever size match you want. So here I am uh, separating out the different terminal branches of that first FDS branch. I, you can see the little hemoclips there because otherwise you'll get some oozy issue with those little veins. And I'm bringing that half of the first FDS over towards my ECRB. And you'll see I don't have enough firepower there. I'm going to take the whole thing in a minute. It looks all right, but when I clean it off, it's not good enough. Radial sensory. Let's take down that tendinous edge here because I don't want anything compressing my median nerve. And I'll put my radial sensory uh, to the side of the median nerve. There's FDS coming over to ECRB. And this is when I find out I don't like the size match here. Because if I clean that slushy uh, fatty tissue off, it's too small. So initially that looks good, but I'm gonna come back and take that second branch of the first branch of the FDS. And you can see it's kind of holding it anyway, so I'm going to bring that over. I like the synergy of that transfer, and I think you should do that transfer, not the reverse. Tried that early on, a lot of re-education. There's my radial sensory coming to the side of the median nerve, and I'm putting it on the top of the median nerve because on either side of the median nerve, there's going to be some motor. On the radial side for thenars, on the ulnar side for that last FDS branch. And you can see that little bit of FDS is tethering my transfer and the terminal part is too, it's just too small. It's, and it's too tight. That's too tight. It's too small. I need to go get that rest of that first FDS and neuralize it a bit more off the median nerve proximal. Be careful of those little vessels. Use your hemoclip or you're going to be spending time chasing the little veins. And make sure your hemoclip is distal, and then you divide the nerve proximal. I think that's obvious, but maybe not. So now I've got lots of FDS. I've still got that distal branch of FDS that I'm not using, and um, zero tension. I'll show you the picture with the transfers above those vessels, but sometimes I'll take the transfer below it, depending on tension issues. I've worked really hard donor, donor distal recipient proximal and this repair is perfect. If you don't work hard donor distal recipient proximal, if you're not willing to do that, please do not do this nerve transfer. Or if you don't do that, don't call me up and say the nerve transfer didn't work. I can tell you right now it won't work if you don't have a lot of redundancy on the donor recipient. This is the entrapment point that Wartenberg described between the brachioradialis and ECRL compressing the radial sensory nerve. So I'm going to innervate the radial sensory nerve, and I don't want it going through an entrapment point. I am now flipping the radial sensory nerve over the brachioradialis, but really you don't need that brachioradialis. It's not innervated, it's not working, and it is going to interfere with your sensory transfer and also your um, tendon transfer. So I'm going to divide that BR tendon in a minute. Here's my donor tendon, and now I'm looking for ECRB. And you'll be able to see here what you think of uh, my redundancy of tendon extension on the pronator teres. I'll do the, this is cutting the BR tendon here. You can see the radial sensory is looping over it. And then I've got to take my PT tendon over to ECRB. So I would just get rid of your BR tendon. I do the nerve repairs with nino micro and then some to seal. I have zero tension on my repairs. There's BR tendon going. And I open up widely the epiperineurium on the median nerve for that 
uh, radial sensory to the side of the median nerve. So with that hard work to extend the tendon of the pronator teres, I don't think I have too much extra periosteal extension. Now this fellow had a stiff wrist, um, reasonable enough to do the tendon transfer at the same time, but I pushed that uh, wrist into the maximum extension. I'll use this tendon weave instrument. I imagine everybody has one. If you don't, they're great. Little pokey tendon weaver. And then pick up my periosteum and position the first stitch because the first stitch is going to determine the tension on this uh, tendon transfer. I want it tight. I want the wrist back in extension. I don't want too much tension on my pronator teres so that it's ischemic, but I want a lot of tension on it. I'm sort of pulling in both directions and I'll put a 3-0 ethabon in and then I'll be able to move the wrist back and forth to make sure he can still come into um, wrist flexion and extension um, with um, ease. So if you see in the far right of the screen, that's the extent of the periosteum that I have. And I would argue that that's not too much. And if you don't work hard to go distal enough with that pronator teres extension on the periosteum attachment to the radius, then you may not have a, a successful tendon transfer for wrist extension. The post-operative immobilization of this surgery is determined by the tendon transfer, not the nerve transfer. The nerve transfer, I would just have the patient in a sling for a week. There's no tension on it. But the tendon transfer will be as per tendon transfer protocol. So I position the uh, forearm in pronation to take tension off the tendon transfer, the elbow flexed, and then the wrist in um, full extension, maybe just a little off full extension with the fingers free. And the whole immobilization period is a month, but I give them some elbow movement at two weeks. Well, I shouldn't say I do that. My hand therapist um, manages the post-operative protocol, of course. And now that I like the tension on that, now I can just do my back and forth uh, weave, weaving it in a few times. And um, I think that's about, I think that's about it. The um, Immobilization now, as, as I've described, we'll close it up and um, I put marking in the incision. I'll usually put a drain in, making sure that it's far away from my nerve repairs and a pain pump. And um, my closure is just with layers of monocryl. The um, tendon transfer um, range of movement is going to be uh, checked again at the end of the procedure, but really the setup is key with that first uh, stitch. And I'm going to take advantage of this tendon transfer to give me some immediate wrist extension, and then I'm going to wait for the um, uh, nerve transfers to get that thumb and index, a uh, thumb and fingers working well, and also to give me stronger uh, wrist extension with the innervation of ECU and, and ECRB. So this type of uh, procedure is one that is ideal for a patient that needs the fluidity of the finger extension for their work and is willing to wait the year to get that recovery. By contrast, I probably do five to one full tendon transfers as per nerve transfers because the tendon transfers are going to give you a result within just a few months and you're really going to wait a year to get the uh, beautiful result of independent finger and thumb extension with these nerve transfers. But for someone who has a job that requires that fluidity, nothing beats a great result with this median to radial nerve transfer. This is also, of course, for fourth and fifth degree injuries, injuries that are not going to come back. So you're never gonna do a nerve transfer for something that's got a possibility of recovery. And there you are. Thanks very much.